All right, we're staying on schedule uh, with our next talk from Christian Paquin, who is a cryptography specialist at Microsoft, talking about post-quantum cryptography. So welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, well, hello, Montreal. It's good to be back in my hometown. Um, I've been here. I live now somewhere south in the state. And um, it's a great pleasure to come and, and, and come talk about some recent work on uh, the topic of post-quantum cryptography. If you've been in the previous talk, you know a little bit about that. And my goal today is uh, to, sh to uh, well, my, my main goal is to, to uh, have you leave with uh, the idea that uh, even though quantum computers might be a few years away, there are some action items that uh, the security community needs to take now to protect against quantum attacks. Because there's one important factor that um, even though attackers, quantum hackers might be uh, something of the future, uh, the attacks can actually happen today because data that can be captured today can be decrypted in the future. So I'll be uh, talking about that. And I'm going to illustrate my little hackers with the gnomes. I don't know if you remember that, if you have ever watched 20 years ago this episode from South Park. And they introduced these really weird gnomes. And uh, they had a very interesting business model. They would go around in people's houses and steal their underpants. And then, well, in some unknown and undecided fashion, they had a plan to take this and make profit at the end of the day. Turns out it's not a great business to be in the underpants model. So, well, we'll see what's going to happen with these guys later. On a completely unrelated note, 20 years ago, something else happened. I was studying right up the hill here at the University of Montreal in Gilles Brassard's lab, uh, these wonderful things that are quantum computers. Uh, they were great on paper, these mathematical, magical properties that Philip explained that allow you with superposition entanglement to uh, calculate wonderful things that are impossible to do with a conventional computer. Well, that was great. And uh, after my studies, I needed to get a paycheck, so I transitioned to a more practical uh, sphere of the industry, became an applied cryptographer. And... Um, well, now, fast forward a few years, quantum computers start to look a bit more real and a bit more, uh, uh, not so much science fiction, but just a matter of time before they're going to be built. And there are like literally millions of dollars being poured into that, uh, a little bit more, actually. Uh, and now, most of the world thinks that they're just uh, a decade away, maybe. So that would be a big revolution for uh, the field of computing. In fact, I have colleagues at Microsoft and MSR that are building the actual physical chips, the physical hardware to run the, the quantum computing. And on the other side of the hall, there's a software team building all sorts of quantum simulation software to write. Even they, they released a plugin this year, a, quant a quantum development kit that you can plug it into Visual Studio and start writing quantum software. So it's, it's starting to feel really real. And this weird machine that you see on the screen, that's uh, actually uh, in the lab of one of our uh, partners in Copenhagen. Uh, it's, you know, this it's very tiny little uh, quantum chip uh, that they're working on. It requires this big machinery and needs to be cooled down to 0.04 Kelvin, which is the coolest place on, on, on the planet. It's colder than deep space. And uh, yeah, these guys really play with the coolest toys, quite literally. <laughs> and so, so that's all great. And it's, it's quantum computing will revolutionize what, what's going to happen, what we'll be able to do. It has tons of applications in chemistry to analyze molecular structures and come up with new compounds. Uh, there's a lot of applications in, in, in physics. All is great. It's all great except for us security practitioners because 
as Philippe explained, uh, the Shore algorithm totally destroys the basis for our modern cryptography. So all the communications on the internet relies on this public cryptography that uh, becomes essentially uh, unusable if the attacker has a quantum computer. And um, also this, this second algorithm that Grover discovered in 96 affects the, the, the security of the symmetric cryptography, the hash functions, and the, uh, the symmetric encryption, but we can deal with that. We just need to double the key sizes and, and the hash sizes, so not a big deal. But okay, so just, uh, just considering sure, um, it basically breaks all the crypto that we use today. And I scratch the word most because you know there, there were some old alternatives uh, back in the days that were never used, never been implemented in, in our software. Uh, but essentially everything that we use today is, is gone. So that's TLS, HTTPS, that's signal messaging, that's SSH, that's uh, all your Bitcoins, gone. Uh, certificates, software updates, they all rely on, on public cryptography. So, come, the gnomes are coming back. Now, they, they, they'd like to uh, adapt their business model a little bit. So instead of stealing underpants, what they can do now is simply collect ciphertext. And just wait, just record the, the internet traffic, and now they have an idea for phase two. They just have to wait for a quantum computer, and then when they do, they can just decrypt it. Of course, it's quite an analogy, but uh, there are a lot of adversaries uh, that have this capability today to just, you know, every major country, every sufficiently large organization can record a huge amount of data. So if you are working in a, as a, you know, a hacker developer in a small community or in a big corporate environment, the question is, do you have data that's encrypted, transferred on the internet today, that needs to be secure for the foreseeable future. And um, if you do, then how long is that data needs to be secure for? Because if there's a risk that somebody records it and decrypts it later, then you might need to think about this post-quantum cryptography today, not when the quantum computer comes. So now it's a valid question uh, of when is that's gonna be. Uh, yeah, Philip mentioned uh, also the, 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 the work of my Michele Mosca that uh, had a huge analysis, of course, is to estimate the time of when this quantum computer will be. It's, it's a lot of guesswork. There's like physicists involved in the, 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 uh, how to build the, the hardware, and then the mathematicians, the best quantum attacks we could build with this model. But there's a lot of very smart people that, and, and that look at the problem and they estimate it you know, maybe a decade, 12 years, 20, 30, that there's a very large risk that there might be a quantum computer then. So there's a clear need for the industry to move to this new type of cryptography, that's post-quantum cryptography. And I want to make it clear here, post-quantum cryptography doesn't mean that you need a quantum computer to do this cryptography. That's just normal crypto that we don't know how to break with a quantum computer. And there are, if, uh, okay, I'll just complete that sentence in one slide. <clears throat> just now, uh, the motivation of why, again, just to repeat a little bit of myself, why do we care about this today? First, because of this capture now, decrypt later problem. So data is at risk. Okay, great, maybe I've convinced you of that, maybe not. But second, the, the other points are also very important. If you've ever worked in a standard body before, you'll, you'll know that it takes a long time to change standards and get uh, new algorithms or new designs adopted. TLS 1.3, for example, took you know, quite a while to, uh, uh, to go through. And uh, so if we need to update these algorithms and all these standards, it's gonna take a long time. So we need to get started. And also, not just the, the standards themselves, the crypto stack also needs to be updated. So all the, uh, the, uh, the application libraries, all the software uh, takes a long time. And we need to know when we're gonna plug in these new algorithms, uh, some of them will have bigger keys, they have longer computational time, 
uh, some assumptions are different than what we used before, our elliptic curves and RSA, so can the software deal with it? Is our code agile enough to be able to swap in RSA? Like how many pieces of software I've seen with just RSA are coded directly in there, and they'll be quite hard to, to make a switch. So these are issues that we can tackle now and, and start to experiment with, not to be surprised when it's gonna be the time to switch. And that's kind of what I hinted earlier. So if you have data that needs to be secure for a long time, then backtrack all these steps, then we kind of get, we need to get started today. Well, fortunately, this is happening in, the, in academia and in the industry, it's recognized that we need this transition. In fact, NIST, which is the uh, National, uh, Standard, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technologies in the US, that basically is the de facto uh, standard organization of the world because most of their um, standards get adopted around the planet, they have started the standardization process to replace RSA and elliptic curve public key cryptography with uh, new algorithms. We're currently in phase two, round two, of this multi-year process. It's gonna be six, seven year process. And they're looking for all sorts of new ideas in all sorts of, from all sorts of math families. Uh, in round one, there was 69 proposals. They're down to 26 now in round two. And it's, it's continuing. So um, I don't wanna, I'll go fast on this because Philip presented about that. But essentially these new, uh, math proposals are not based on factoring and discrete logarithms like RSA and uh, Diffie-Elman were, uh, were using. Instead, they use lattices, they record in codes, multivariate systems, hash-based functions, uh, isogenies, zero-knowledge proofs even. Uh, my colleagues have participated in four of these proposals, and they're still in round two. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you can take a look at these uh, uh, specific proposals. <clears throat> I'll uh, tweet out the slides uh, afterwards, so uh, you'll, you'll get all the, the links. So, okay, so now if you're a developer, I mean, you can deal with that. It's like you just told me I need to replace RSA, but with what? Like, I don't want to, I don't have, I don't know which one of the 26 proposals to pick. How do I deal with that? And what if one gets, uh, disqualified in round three, uh, I'm stuck with that, what do I do? So um, one thing that, that we did, just asking ourselves all these same questions, is uh, to join this, uh, this group, this Open Quantum Safe project, which is an open source group, uh, with the goal of providing a, a unified framework for this post-quantum cryptography. And the idea is that everyone with, with the schemes, the NISC, schemes, we can plug it into this, uh, this library, and then when you want to experiment with it and integrate it into your higher level applications, you just uh, code to the, uh, what we call OQS library. And then if you want to try a scheme, you just configure it this way, and if you want to call this other scheme, you just switch, you're gonna call Psyche instead of Frodo, then you don't have to modify the application. And, uh, our motivation to join and do this work was to, uh, we were doing tests, implementing our algorithms in TLS, and you know, we don't want to do it 50 times, so do it once, and then you can just switch the underlying algorithms, and it's, it's quite easy and, and very efficient in development time. So uh, over the last few years, the OQS project kind of grew, so now we have uh, a core library in C, we have a bunch of wrappers in C++, C Sharp, Java, there's some other coming. Um, and we also uh, ship forks of uh, OpenSSL and OpenSSH uh, that integrate this post-quantum crypto. And I'm gonna be demonstrating that in, in a few minutes. Um, what else is there to say there? Just, uh, yeah, it's a collaborative effort. If you're interested, uh, in, in participating and, and you have some expertise in some other applications you'd like to see uh, post-quantum crypto integrated, well, please reach out and, and either offer here's, hey, hey, I have did this work and you in integrated it in the project or submit pull requests. Uh, where it's a very cooperative effort and we're welcoming help from anybody. Okay, 
Now in the second part, I'm gonna explain some of the integrations we did in the different protocols. And uh, you may be interested in that just as a developer or as a user. If you'd like to, hey, I'm using OpenSSL, I'm using OpenSSH, maybe I can try to just plug it some, or use some of the uh, post-quantum variant uh, in there to, to protect myself and my services and, and product, project, uh, sorry, products um, against quantum computing. So, um, well, TLS, of course, is uh, uh, arguably the most used security protocol. Um, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, OpenSSL is uh, one of the main libraries implementing it, so that's why we targeted it for our experiments. Uh, we've integrated in TLS 1.2 and 1.3 in two different flavors of OpenSSL. Um, 1.3 is really nice because the way it's architected, uh, the, the changes are, are very uh, minimal. So we do the work in the, in the key share message. Uh, in TLS 1.3, the, the core spec that has been adopted assumes that everything is, looks like elliptic curve, elliptic curve defilement, mm -hmm. and it defines the curves. In the future, there's probably going to be extensions for other algorithms. But right now, we, to integrate in this environment, we have to pretend that our post-quantum algorithms are new curves. So that's how we identify them in the code. And we can just plug and play. Um, what's, oh yeah, so one interesting note is that we need to edge our bets right now. It wouldn't be quite unsafe to just transition to a post-quantum algorithm today. You don't want to do that because they've only been around for a few years. We need a decade at least of, of, of cryptanalysis, of, of really deep analysis to make sure there's nothing wrong with these new ideas. Maybe there's no quantum algorithms for them because the right person hasn't looked at it uh, for long enough, or maybe there's a classical attack against these systems, so we don't know. So to be safe, what we want to do is do a mix, do a hybrid version between the classical um, algorithms that we have today with the post-quantum ones. So th how do you achieve that is, let's say in a key exchange, uh, in the Diffie Elman type of setting, I'm trying to communicate with the web server, so I pick a secret, the web server picks a secret, we exchange a message uh, that uses a secret, and then we can arrive to a common uh, shared key that we use afterwards to protect the communication. So we can do that in parallel. We can have this conversation with elliptic curve diffie Elman and have another one in parallel with our post-quantum algorithm, and then we just mix the master secrets, concatenate them, and then that's fed into the key derivation. And then we end up with um, a key that, that depends both on the classical and post-quantum one. Therefore, if somebody intercepts this communication, decrypts it in 10 years with a quantum computer, they'll be able to break the elliptic curve one part, but not the post-quantum one, because we don't know how to do that with a quantum computer. And if somebody made a mistake in the design of the spec, of the scheme and they break this new algorithm in five years, then our the elliptic curve still protects us. So the hybrid is really uh, the idea to, to achieve that. Um, there are many subtle ways to do that, and there's we're debating what's the best approach. The one I describe is like the naive approach, just do it in parallel and concatenate. It's the easiest to implement, and that's the one that we have in our fork. Um, there are some more advanced ones where you can negotiate which algorithm you want. Um, and in the authentication side, there's also uh, uh, similar ideas uh, for the authentication and the certificate integration. Again, what we've implemented is just this naive approach. We don't say we do RSA and then signature and a, a, uh, and a picnic for, to take one uh, signature and, and mix them, we define a new algorithm. It's called RSA picnic and everything is concatenated. So it's easy to, to implement and integrate. But there are multiple ways to think about it. You could have two certificates, one classical, one post-quantum. You can have one certificate with a post-quantum extension in there. There are a lot of options. So one interesting question is, that, okay, you want us to, uh, play and integrate post-quantum in our deployments, so what's the cost? Uh, 
as everything is going to crawl to a to, to uh, well, slow down to a crawl. There's a reason why some of these algorithms have never been adopted uh, 30 years ago when they were first proposed, because RSA was way better. It was way faster and, and smaller. Like the uh, the correction codes are pff, gigantic key size megabytes of, 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 uh, of artifacts, so we don't want to deal with that. <clears throat> well, fortunately, the, the top candidates have very interesting performances. For example, uh, on the left side, you have the, the key exchange uh, algorithms. Uh, the orange one is the, our base uh, elliptic curve, uh, P256, uh, top of the line, the efficiency and security. And we see that New Hope is the latest one, gets really close to it, this number of fetches per second. Uh, so it's quite competitive. And the one uh, just above it, P256 New Hope, is the hybrid one that I, 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 I mentioned. We do both uh, the elliptic curve one plus the post quantum one in one go. So it doesn't double the cost because a lot of the cost is the rest of the exchange. So the crypto part, you don't pay a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you don't pay a big penalty to, to, to transfer to post quantum. So very interesting. Uh, to start playing with that. That's certainly not a stopper. Same thing for signatures. Uh, basically, this new crypto is, is, is competitive and will, in, in the next few years, be optimized uh, both in algorithmic, algorithmically, can pronounce that word, sorry, and in, in, in hardware, all sorts of optimizations. So that's going to be interesting. SSH. We also did the work. I don't want to repeat myself. It's a little, very similar to TLS in, in conceptually. So similar integration in the key exchange and in the authentication part. So one interesting project I'd like to mention is uh, another one we have. It's called, uh, uh, it's based on the OpenVPN project. Uh, unlike other VPN projects you, uh, that, that use a different uh, protocol, this one uses TLS as, as its security. So we can just use our OpenSSL fork and get the security for free in, in the VPN. So what's interesting is that when you start thinking about all the applications that will need to, to change, it takes a lot of work, dev work to do that. But if you do it at the, on a VPN level, then you can tunnel all your classical unmodified legacy applications through a post-quantum tunnel. And then the adversary uh, outside uh, cannot peek into the, the classical, or even if they can break RSA, they wouldn't be able to get into that post-quantum tunnel. So that's a very interesting model to, uh, to give a blanket protection against quantum computer without actually changing any code and, and deal with all sorts of, of services. So that's uh, something we have. This one is not part of OQS, it's part of our Microsoft research project. You can also open source, you can take a look at it and it uh, gives interesting. Well, interesting thing to play with. And we also integrated uh, in, in the HSM, uh, an Utomaco HSM, some, one of our algorithms. And all of these projects are basically to show that, okay, it works, it works in software, it works in hardware, it works in different deployments, just to get comfortable to say, okay, we want to de-risk these, these new algorithms so that when it's time to transition, when NIST picks some winners and some new standards, we'll be ready, we know what breaks, what doesn't break in the software, we've done the work. Uh, I just want to conclude with a quick demo. Let's see if it shows on the screen, okay. Uh, it's always hard to demo cryptography because, uh, you know, it's uh, just showing a, a green icon on the screen. I'm just gonna show uh, OpenSSL. And maybe you're already familiar with it. If you've played with OpenSSL, it's, this is the OpenSSL client and server tool. So what I'm going to do, I apologize uh, on the small size, but I'm just going to read it to you. This is, I've now just generated a, a new certificate that's a hybrid between uh, ECDSA P256 with QTesla, uh, which is a lattice signature scheme. And the main point here is that that is OpenSSL as you know it, if you know it. It's just, nothing changes other than the algorithm identifier. And now I can start a web server with this. Let's go back to my history, there it is. So I use this certificate and now it's waiting for TLS 1.3 connections and I'm gonna connect from this other console 
This is, by the way, a Windows subsystem for Linux that I use, which is awesome. If you don't know it, I recommend you do it. Ubuntu in a box right here. And then, well, this is the boring demo. Just a bunch of letters, no errors, and it spits out the certificate. And then you can see, uh, if you have really good eyes, that I'm using here, ECDSA QTesla 1 signature, and the key exchange with P256 ECDH E plus Frodo. So I've kind of decided to say, I'm gonna go with lattices for this. The key exchange is a lattice scheme, signature is a lattice scheme, and then this is secure because elliptic curves are secure, and then if you have a quantum computer in 10 years and you've recorded that, then you wouldn't still not be able to decrypt it because uh, the lattice schemes are unbreakable with a quantum computer. And that is it for the presentation. Uh, so the main point is that, okay, quantum computers are gonna come in 10, 20, 50 years, who knows. Uh, as security practitioners, we need to be safe and, and assume the worst. They might come sooner than later, we need to be prepared. And that you need to start thinking about uh, the transition today. So maybe you're thinking, just I need to, I'll, I'll wait when the standard comes out, I'll be ready, I don't develop any of this, I'll just adopt the new software as they get updated. But if you wanna be proactive and you are dealing with, with data that needs to be secure for a decade or, or more, then you might wanna just sprinkle in this post-quantum protection on top of the classical one to uh, make sure that you're safe against this imminent threat. So I thank you for your time. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions now or during the lunch break, which is right now.